Hello my beautiful crypt dwellers, this is the Eldritch Game Vigil and today we're going to start the let's play of Torment Tides of the Minera, a game that released today after a four year development process that was kickstarted in 2013 I think uh, by one of the highest grossing uh, kickstarters of that time. It's the spiritual successor, um, some would say the thematical successor of a game that I really really like a game of uh, 1991, no, no, sorry, 1999, uh, called Tor uh, Planescape Torment. Uh, this was set in the Planescape universe, uh, the Planescape, Plan Planescape campaign uh, universe of Dungeons and Dragons. And this game here is also using a, a, a paper and pen role playing um, uh, rules, campaign rules. Uh, of Numenera. So basically Numenera is um, set in the ninth world, a billion years in the future, uh, civilizations have come and gone and uh, each time um, new civilizations rise on the vestiges of the old one and basically um, artifacts from um, the previous civilizations, they are very highly sophisticated technological uh, devices but each time as each civilization rebuilds itself, uh, the knowledge is lost and um, those artifacts are mostly like magic. So in this game you are going to incarnate the last cast of... Um, so the backstory basically is that um, a godlike being has uh, found the way of immortality by creating replicas of himself. And um, he transfers this, uh, his conscience from replica to replica. But each time uh, the conscience is transferred, the cast of uh, body develops a conscience of its own. And uh, you are going to incarnate the last cast of the last body that has been cast away by uh, this godlike person. And uh, a new conscience yourself is going to be born into it. So I was debating about uh, uh, doing uh, a full uh, let's play of this with dialogue and everything but as these games are very dialogue intensive uh, I might just uh, just skip this for a time when my voice <laughs> cuts off um, some parts of it are anyway uh, spoken so but uh, if at one moment or the other you will just see me reading uh, on screen and not speaking out the words sorry for that but uh, uh, if this is as dialogue intensive as um, Planescape Torment, there's more than a million words. We'll see how that happens. So let's start without further ado. Okay, some correct location. I'm going to be a male. in darkness. Aching cold sets into an unfamiliar body. A distant howling surrounds you, louder with each passing second. Insistent and invisible hands slap and tear at the membrane that protects you. Your first emotion is an involuntary and formless panic. You feel you have forgotten something, something important, as if it once meant the world to you, but the details slip away as you grasp at them. You force your eyes open. Okay, um, I'm going to have a look around. A white pink fleshy cocoon surrounds you. Even as you look, a minor rent in its side tears open and the howling wind forces its way inside. The cocoon rips away, gone before you can grab it, spinning you into a dizzying tunnel. You are falling, the world many kilometers beneath you. You catch a glimpse of a curved horizon and also the ground beneath you that is approaching deceptively quickly. Above you, a small moon is slowly collapsing in upon itself. A corona of acid green and black energy playing around its edges. The wind buffets you and burns your eyes, but you don't need to see the details of the faraway ground to know you're in serious trouble. You won't survive a fall from this stratospheric height. A part of your frantic mind babbles that technically you probably fell from a thermospheric height. You struggle to stay focused as the ground rushes toward you. Okay, let's see. I'm going to flatten out the wings. Instinctively, you spread your arms and legs, and they respond sluggishly. You stop tumbling head over heels. Though you are still spinning laterally, that motion has calmed as well, and you have space to assess your situation, and perhaps to understand the predicament and the body in which you find yourself. 
Below you, you see a large landmass. A massive ocean dominates the rest of the visible globe, dotted here and there with island chains. Small moons, unusual structures, and strange machines rush past you in glittering profusion as you plummet toward the ground. Now you see that this appears to be a huge megacontinent, the only land of any size on this side of the world at least. Great inland seas and lakes dot the land, and curiously, regular mountain ranges march up and down and across. You are falling toward what looks to be a great bay, a sprawling city perched on its shore just to the north. Further to the north and east, you see a broad plain scattered with curious structures visible even from this height. The northeastern portion of this land looks to be a desert, a strange blue dot like an eye in its exact center. It seems to hold a city in its watery grasp. To its west is a ring of huge mountains surmounted by enormous carved peaks spewing magma into a central catch basin. What concerns you most right now is the bay below you. It's coming at you quickly. I'm going to try to remember how I came to be in this situation. You don't seem to have any other option. You close your eyes to the world below you. Ignore the rushing of the wind past you and concentrate. You remember that you were in the hallways of a place that wove itself through your blood, through your thoughts. The memories project themselves in your mind, a story told to you as if they happened to someone else. Yet it was your body that walked those halls, your lungs that breathed that air. You were running because something was hunting you. A nightmare far more powerful than you. Were you powerful? Examining your stolen memory, you know that you were. What could have stood against you? Who wielded instruments of flame and time itself? The name is on the tip of your tongue. You were... Who? Who were you? If you somehow managed to sidestep everything you know about anatomy, physics, and death, and you were surprised to realize that you do know something about them, and you survived this fall, you suspect that you might be able to reawaken a dormant strength you sense inside you. But who could possibly survive a fall from this height? Yep. You remember reaching an escape tube, and you remember being struck by a tendril of force, and then the fall. The fall. You open your eyes in time to see a riot of color around you, your descent barely slowed, and then agony flares throughout your body as a crunching impact destroys you. The last thing you hear is a rapidly cycling whine of energy, and then... darkness. Kablam! Well, that changes from uh, awakening as a prisoner. <laughs> Looking at you, Elder Scrolls. Okay. Yep, that seems obvious. Alright, what do we have here? Jumbled thoughts cloud your head as you study the empty bowl before you. Drops of liquid fall from the ceiling, spattering on the ground next to the bowl. The light from every drop is reflected in the bowl's rounded hollow, as if it hungers for that light and needs to be filled. Yet the bowl remains dry. Another drop falls from the ceiling and splashes across the pylons, wasted. You trace your fingers over the slippery, overlapping scales that spiral up from the bottom of the bowl. The sharp, toothed rim plucks at your skin. It's going to be tricky to move this bowl without slicing your fingers on the edge. You might have to put some effort into it. Reflected light streaks across the surface of the bowl as another droplet falls from the ceiling. Well, let's move it then. Okay, these are the tutorial messages. You've encountered your first task. You have three stat pools, might, speed and intellect, that you can spend to increase your chances of success. This is called using effort. To more easily move the boat in front of you, use right left mouse click to spend might for a higher level of effort. Don't worry if you fail this task. In torment, failure often results in interesting outcomes. Which is also a thing. I'm not going to do any safe scumming here. Um, I'm just going to assume that my actions are irreversible. And unless I'm getting killed, well, I'm not going to go back on any of my choices. Okay, well, let's say least effort. You never know. Okay, that means I... Success! You carefully take hold of the bowl, avoiding the teeth on the serrated rim. With a deep breath, you move it over the glowing pool of fallen light. Hmm. 
Whee! <laughs> drop by drop, the bowl fields, ripples spreading over the blurred outline of your reflection. A pale blue luminescence stretches into the corners of the room. A clear radiance spills across the segmented floor, washing away the nearest shadows and pouring into your mind, melting the ragged edges of your fragmented thoughts. You are not whole, not yet, but you have begun to heal from the damage done in your long fall. A voice calls out from somewhere high above, beyond the reaches of the spreading light. Hello? Are you still alive down there? Alright, let's go over here and interact. As soon as you touch the orb, a memory floods your mind. You stand in front of a rusted door. The air is humid and dank. You've had a moment's respite from this waterlocked hell, a bubble of stale air at your resting point. You've breathed water before, and you've lived decades beneath the waves. But this body is an air breather, and the constant pressure has been crushing you ever so subtly. Worse, your companion's mind seems to be wandering from the task at hand. He's a genius with machines, as you well know, but now he seems distracted. The device in his hands is covered in knobs, wires and antennas. He believes it can get the two of you through the corroded door, but he's merely staring at it. Perhaps he's lost faith in his invention, but that is hardly your concern. This mission cannot be delayed, you must proceed. Okay. Deception, threatening, or oh, using a spell. Ah, yeah, I don't want to be a bully, so I don't want to be a liar either for the moment. <laughs> so, trying to cast a spell, an esoteric. You mumble a few words, drawing power from the air around you until a solution appears in your mind. You snatch the device from his hands, you wire it, and shove it back at him. Oh, he says, examining your work. Sorry, I was trying to improve the thing. He waves a device at the door, and the stale air of your bubble freshens as the door swings open. A dark hallway lies beyond. A passage that links the water bordered cells and aquatic viewing areas. What you seek lies there. Moments later, you're underwater again. Your hands closing around a strange yet familiar artifact. You need it to complete something. It hovers above a pedestal, rotating in the dark water. An electric current runs through your fingers as your hand crosses the vertical plane of the pedestal, and an iridescent field coalesces so fast that the wave of pressure dazes you for a moment. The rising pulse of a sonar alarm ripples through the water. The guards won't be far behind. Okay, I'm not gonna run. I'm going to use one of the devices on my belt. You run urgent fingers over the devices fastened to the waist, a fog rising in your mind. A few can be used against the guards, but will also turn your skin to synth steel or the surrounding water to boiling wax. Hardly ideal. Finally, you will find you find a silver small a small silver spear. Setting the sphere into place, you kick desperately for the safety of a nearby alcove. The sphere whirls and unfolds into a spiraling vortex. The sphere at its center speaks to a speaks a few polite words in an ancient language then begins spreading the surrounding water into itself with alarming speed. The approaching guards shout, then scream as they too are sucked into the whirlpool and ripped to pieces. You allow yourself a fleeting smile, but you are all too aware that more alarms are going to go off in the distance. The memory begins to fade, as if you were being drawn backward through a tunnel and you hear more pylons rising from the pit. Something is wrong. The events within the orb have settled into that gap in your mind, but the edges of it are rough, as though the memory itself is not truly yours. There's something else, a gust of sour air pulling at you, like a predator inhaling the scent of its prey at the far end of a dark, whispering yield field. Okay.
You stand beside a woman of on a verdant crag. Beneath the two of you is a broad plateau towering above the overgrowth far below. Strange machines have been built into the cliffside, presumably for reconnaissance or defense. A metallic disc gleams from the center of the plateau. You are self-aware humanoid machines drill into the base of the cliffs below. If you are looking for a sanctuary and you were desperately, this seems like the right place. I don't know about this, the woman says, her voice flat, neutral. Her face is turned away from you. What makes this place any more secure than the other ones we found? Um, yeah. You shade your eyes against the bright sun so you can point out the thin bands radiating out from the metallic disc, how the energy from those bands affects the local fauna, suggesting an enormous source of prior world energy. She thinks deeply. It's geologically sound. Have you won the sounding samples and checked the strata? No major caverns or weaknesses showed up on your resonance scans? She waits for your affirmation and says, All right, I'm convinced. The two of you sketch your plans for the sanctuary, drawing schematics and architectural diagrams. Then you descend onto the plateau to examine the open ground. The woman suggests having one of the servitors build a shelter for your time here. You try to draw one of the constructs away from its task, but it doesn't respond to your voice. When you lay a hand on its shoulder to reinforce your command, it whirls and strikes you across the face with inhuman speed. It turns back to its task, ignoring you. Your companion helps you rise, laughter in his eyes. It seems your construct has other ideas. What's the matter with it? Uh... Okay. A mist falls onto the plateau as you activate the time scared artifacts fastened to the construct's behavioral core with a sub vocalized command. With an abrupt clack and a pulse of pleasant warmth, the device purged the error and seven copper banded spheres drop out of evenly spaced drifts in the air. Ignoring the common side effect, you give new orders to the malfunctioning construct in a firm, clear voice. Acknowledged. It obediently trundles to the side of your new shelter. The image freezes, then fades, and you feel the memory filling the gap in your mind, block by jacket block. You stagger, clutching your head, reclaiming your memories, hurts. And once more, there's something else. Hairs lift, one by one, on the back of your neck. Something beyond this room can sense what you are doing, and is hunting you. Okay, new pathway is open. A vision of a city springs up around you, your city, in flames and under attack. Her defenders have fought and died all day, and still the attackers keep coming. They fight as if your destruction were demanded of them. They care nothing for mercy, surrender or plunder. What they want is blood. But you have brought a keen-eyed companion to the top of the tower. She has seen a way to stop the invaders. You need to get her to safety, and you need to rally your defenders. But even as you turn toward the door of the tower, two of the attackers descend from a hovering machine. You don't have time to strike at them before they land. One is brutishly large, his weapon a vibrating axe. The other is slim, sheathed in glassy armor and holding a hilt with a sizzling invisible blade. Your companion backs away. She is too young to help. Your enemies advance single file, confined by the parapet. Um, um, another fighter, a lot too roguish. Well, I fight defensively. The memory seems crystal clear. The giant is menacing, it's true, but the invisible blade of his companion is more worrisome still. The energy field that flickers and wavers around it suggests that she can carve matter at the molecular level, tearing pieces of her target into nothingness. If you're to save yourself, your best bet is to tackle her first. She's stuck behind the giant, waiting her turn to attack you, unable to bring her weapon to bear until he's out of the way. But it's clear that she expects him to handle you. And her eyes rove behind you, her focus on your ward. She's certainly not expecting you to dive between the giant's legs and come up inside her guard. She can't bring the blade to burr in time and to drive your dagger up under her chin. You catch her before her deadly blade laid drops onto you and spin her around. The weapon sl slashes into the giant and he topples, bisected. The immediate threat ended, you focus on finding a way back to your allies. 
You open the tower door and rush down the stairs. The door at the base of the stairs is slightly cracked, opening just a bit into the hall, and you hear more of the enemy soldiers beyond. Well, I'm going to sneak past them. You press yourself against the gleaming door, easing it, easing it open, and your breath catches in your throat as it squeaks quietly, the sound like a bell in your memory. You pause, but the soldiers in the hall continue to talk. You push again, squeeze yourself through the narrow opening and creep down the bloodstained hall. The memory begins to fade and you find yourself back in your own body. Your temples throb with the racing force of your heartbeat and the reclaimed memories blaze within you like a bonfire on a mountain peak, visible to every predator for kilometers around. A tremor rocks the floor beneath you as through a massive fist has struck the room itself. Swaying on your feet, you see frantic movement within the borders of a mirror at the edge of the room. Yeah, so I guess this, one's just, this is some kind of um, tutorial on how to create your character. Let's look into the mirror. The border of this mirror is lavishly decorated with a dizzying number of interlocked symbols. Daggers, masks, paintbrushes, amulets, and more. But that's nothing compared to what you see in the glass. You see a vast crowd of people, exact doppelgangers of you, shoving, arguing with, and fighting each other. Most are drab imitations of you, but a few pressures are vivid and pull at your attention. Each of them bears an intricate pentagonal tattoo on their head. In the eyes, the actions, you see the memories you discovered within the orbs and the choices you made, shining like distant stars. Your hand twitches at your side, and through some of the bright doppelgangers ignore you, an even smaller number immediately turn on you, waiting for you to choose them and learn what you might become. A rumble shakes the room, and a slow vibration spreads from the darkness below, rippling towards the ceiling. Okay, uh, one guy is moving cautiously, clever eyes... Hmm. Clever... Yeah, I think I'm gonna go with. Uh, this guy. Sliding around the edge of the unruly crowd, the doppelganger cautions you to silence with a finger at his lips. Together, you scan the room and its inhabitants, noting every potential hazard and hearing every drip of a strange liquid in the depths beneath your feet. Quietly, the doppelganger waits for your decision. Okay. The remaining doppelgangers scatter for the edges of the mirror and vanish. Your chosen identity steps forward. Its appearance changes as it steps out of the rippling glass. Its face exudes intelligence and confidence. Shadows of several devices shimmer all around it. Technology of several kinds from a myriad of past ages. You get the feeling it, you, would be comfortable with all of it. The word nano sounds in your mind. Okay, it looks like I gained a descriptor. Your doppelganger continues walking, stepping into you, filling you, making you whole. Your decision rings out into the cavernous room, awakening and unlocking vast mechanisms behind the walls. Suddenly, a grotesque noise rings through your shared worlds. Like a bell, if bells could rot, something is coming. The mirror fades, leaving a dark open doorway. You take a deep breath and step through. Okay, this is then proper to the character creation. So I guess these questions will just like to guide you towards um, what kind of class you're going to uh, want to play. Your choices in the memories and the mirror have begun to build your character, but now you have the opportunity to decide a number of details. Okay, type defines the abilities and skills. Alright. Yeah, he told me to be a nano. So Nano is like the mages. Okay. We've got actually three choices of character. Glaive, which I think is the fighter. Jack is the jack of all trades. And the Nano is, yeah, the, the magician. Okay. Huh. What am I going to do? Yeah, okay, uh, in, in Planescape Torment, 
You started off as a fighter, but you could respec later on. Um, but you could allocate um, your stats to whatever you wanted. And basically, playing a very highly intelligent and very uh, wise character would open up the most of the um, um, the options, dialogue options. But I think here the system is different. So, hmm. I'm not gonna play um, a fighter, so I'm torn between the nano and the jack. Um, I don't want to be a jack of all trades, so I think I'm going to go with the jack. Jacks are intrepid explorers and adventurers, jacks of all trades, hence the name. Although the world also hearkens back to fables of involving a wily, resourceful hero who always seems to be named Jack. Jacks are at their best where they combine weapons, armor, esoteries, ciphers, and a clever tongue. They are treasure hunters, grifters, scouts, rogues, and experts in a variety of fields. Yeah, he's a pretty balanced character, so I think I'm gonna go with that. Next, I'm going to have to choose my stat pools. Okay. Um, I think I'll just go evenly with increasing everything and giving me a slight edge on intellect because I'm a clever jack. <laughs> Next. Okay, now the abilities unlocked by your type can be active actions or unique passive effects. So I can choose two of those. So. Um, yeah, give me some kind of attack. Infuse weapon and then, yeah, I see myself giving sucker punches to the unaware. Yeah. Most skills increase your chance of success on specific kinds of actions and tasks. Okay, passive bonuses. All right, I've got already heavy weapons. I've got perception. I've got running and concentration. So I can choose now an exploration skill. Um. I think I'm going to take this one. Uh, this is Anamnesis, uh, which will enable me to access the memories of previous co previous consciousnesses. This is something that uh, remember, more reminds me of uh, a capacity that, that you had in Planescape Torment. So I'm going to go with this. I don't have weapon skills, as only Glaives will receive those. Uh, although you choose to, your descriptor from among the many doppelgangers in the mirror, you now have the chance to view the specific bonuses and penalties it grants. So, it gives me the observant. Which gives me one training level in perception and one in concentration. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. I think I'll go with that. Charming. Oh, that's... No, I'd rather be observant, you know. Okay, last chance. Here we go. Okay, that completes the character development. Okay. Whoa. The Spectre says, Everything about the spectral figure seems dreamlike. He is a ha hazy silhouette who seems to be made of blue glass smoke. He wears stylish, well-cut clothes. His handsome, bearded face seems hauntingly familiar, though you've never seen him before. He breathes a sigh of relief when he sees you. We weren't sure that would work. We pulled our strength and channeled it to me to switch you, to wake you up. He glances at another figure here and frowns unhappily. It took more out of them than we thought. The other reflections, they are more like shadows now. Look, I'll bet you've got a lot of questions. This whole place is basically in your mind. Your body is still out there in the real world, healing from that fall. You need to get out there and finish the process. It shouldn't be too hard. Okay. After you wake up from this dream state and attune to the tides, you'll need to find something called a resonance chamber. Your body should have landed somewhere near it. Just climb inside that and everything will be fine. I remember pieces about a resonance chamber, but not the whole. 
It's the crystal sarcophagus. I remember it having five mechanical arms around it and a metal ring set in the floor. I think we, we were aiming for it when we fell. When you open your eyes in the real world, it should be nearby. Tides are like a force, like gravity or magnetism or something, except they respond to people's actions and perceptions. Your body, that is, your body in the real world, needs the tides to survive. It's not something you need to worry about. Your body will attune as it wakes up. Okay. That's, that's a memory I don't want to recall. Large, black, furious. It's our death. It's the sorrow. I hope it's lost interest in you. If it finds us, we're done for. What is other people? That's what they are. As I said, it's your mind. You'll find reflections of people you knew. People you met in the real world and with whom you shared some kind of psychic connection. I don't know how or why. It just happens. It's your mind. A construct built to... I don't know. Share thoughts? Store your true self? Wait. You know how people say... In the first place, this is definitely the first place of your memory. Well, it was the first place for me anyway. You'll probably know better, since it's yours. If you don't remember now, maybe it'll come back to you later. I'm... I'm you. I'm part of your mind, a splinter. I was waiting here for you. We called you, with the memories of the others who are here. I don't know what happened next. I'm just part of you. I look at you and I know. This place was made for you, for us. And I remember pieces of knowledge that come to me when you ask your questions. But that's all. Huh? There's a portal down there. It'll take you back to your body. Just step through it and the whole tides thing should take care of itself. When you wake up, find the resonance chamber and activate it. Then we can... What in hell is that? It's the sorrow. Well, how nice. The sorrow is anchored to those reflections. It's devouring their power. We have to get rid of them. Destroy its anchors or else the sorrow will erase us forever. We are in combat. Combat is called crisis. The crisis begins when you enter into a dangerous situation. Crisis are turn-based encounters where you can fight, sneak, manipulate the environment or talk your way out of trouble. Each turn you can take one fighting action to attack or activate an ability. You can also make one move. That reflection near you, kill it. You lose the Zoro's anchor. Okay. Use mouse to attack an enemy or move into a position. Try clicking the highlighted character now. Okay. Poor guy. Effort can be applied to attacks to increase your chance to hit. As with other tasks, each level of effort increases your chances by 20% at the cost of one point from a stat pool. Unarmed attacks use speed, but other weapons and abilities may use might or intellect instead. Okay, uh, let's just try this. Oh, I missed. Okay. When you apply a 4 to an attack, it also increases the damage you deal. Different weapons and abilities gain different amounts of bonus and fire damage from effort. And just hit it for... Wow! You've already used your action in this turn and you will need to wait until your next turn to deal with another reflection. But you can move somewhere to spend your main move. But if you want to end turning out early, you can click and turn in the lower left. I'm going to try to get closer. So spawns copies of itself. I don't like that. Get to the next one. Yes, I wish. You can sacrifice your action for the turn to double move instead of attacking. Okay. I can attack him. Uh, 
bit far. I got him too. Wow. It's infecting it somehow. Oh, Jesus. It's stronger now, I guess. Fettles are temporary conditions or status effects that can improve or reduce his character's stats. The sower has just placed a fettle on the remaining reflection. You can't remove this fettle, but you may find a way to overcome it. Okay. Yeah, I'm just going to go for us 100% on this. The armor stat reduces physical damage. The fettle the sower placed on this character has boosted the armor by 10, meaning it will absorb 10 points of damage from each attack. The reflection's armor is now hi too high for you to overcome it with your unarmed attack. Okay. Activate an item, left click on an item's icon in the bar above your portrait, then click on the character you want to target. Okay, first. So this is this piece of glass deals physical damage and refills all user stat pools. Okay, this is some kind of a one one off. it loose. That thing is a cancer, an infection. It's unstoppable, but you stopped it. I can't believe it found us. In here. That thing, the sorrow, it's been hunting you. It's what killed you in the first place. It'll keep hunting you until you activate the resonance chamber. I didn't, I didn't remember until I saw it, but that's why the chamber is so important. You have to get back and activate the chamber before it's too late. Portal to your body is that shimmering dome there. Go now. Okay. All right. Okay. I think. Uh, yeah, we had a mark. So um, I'll stop uh, this recording for now, and um, I'll see you again f uh, for the next in the next part where we go out of this dream state and we enter the real world of Tides of Numenera. See you soon.